<clears throat> and uh, also, before I uh, start my lecture, because I often forget, but uh, if you're interested in buying the book, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, well, Francis Tavern will send you a link, Amazon.com. Also, if you're interested in a signed copy, uh, you could send an email to Sarah and she'll get in touch with me and I, I could uh, mail you one. Um, okay, uh, this new book and my earlier book was Kidnapping the Enemy, the Special Operations to Capture Generals Charles Lee and Richard Prescott. So I spoke about that about five years ago and I said I was gonna have this book out, so now I do. That was about um, the capture of Charles Lee. This is obviously a, a different topic. Uh, and I said in that book, I'm trying to present a fair and balanced view of Charles Lee. He's a very controversial figure. Um, and uh, for the most of the time, he was when he was in the Continental Army, he was second in command to General Washington. So Charles Lee is an important person in the Continental Army. The two most recent um, full-length biographies of Lee take opposite extreme positions in evaluating his conduct in the Revolutionary War. One takes the position that every move he made was self-serving. Uh, another takes a position that he was a brilliant general, a talented uh, radical revolutionary, but that he was misunderstood. Uh, to me, to judge Lee's conduct, you have to be objective. And in my book, I argue that after his capture, Lee committed treason. That's not good. But I also argue that after that his convictions following the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse for failing to attack the enemy and for an unwarranted retreat were unjustified. So taking more of a balanced view. Um, you might have, I think uh, if you were at uh, some, uh, Philip Pappas wrote the book that was a very pro uh, Charles Lee. So uh, he was in Dominic Mazzaghetti. You might have heard that book. He was very anti-Charles Lee, so I'm, I'm in between. Uh, both these issues are legal ones. I'm a lawyer, so that's great. There's the law, the applicable facts to the law, and you arrive at a conclusion. I want to talk about his treason first. Charles Lee was uh, born in England, and I'm going to bring up the um, PowerPoint. Can you see that? Is that all right? Okay. And there is... Um, that's Charles Lee. That's the book first. Uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, he had been a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. So that's important to understand. He served in North America. He served in Portugal during the French and Indian War. He was a soldier of, war of fortune in Portugal, Russia, and Turkey. So here's a uh, picture of Lee. It's the only known likeness of Lee. We don't have any when he was a Revolutionary War general. Uh, but a friend called this the best likeness of him, which is kind of embarrassing. He, he wasn't known as being particularly handsome, and he had a large nose. Uh, but he does have that Pomeranian dog there called Spado. So uh, he, he, was, he, uh, he actually loved dogs, which is very odd. He thought that people thought that was odd in those days. But he thought he said that uh, dogs were more reliable friends than humans. And, you know, who can argue with that? Uh, Lee did move to America in 1773. He said, America is the land of liberty, and that's where I want to be. In June 1775, Congress selected him as a major general in the Continental Army. He had much more experience than, than uh, other candidates. He became its second in command, subordinate only to General Washington. On December 13, 1776, while he was spending the night at a tavern in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, three miles from the main body of his troops, Lee was surprised by British dragoons, captured after a brief but violent struggle, and he was spirited away. He wound up in New York City, and he was confined there uh, in a two-room apartment by guards. Here's an image, a colorized image of uh, the capture of Lee. You can see him giving up his sword. What's wrong with this picture? If you were at a, my Kidnapping the Enemy lecture, you would know. Lee is in a red coat, and Harcourt, who captured Lee and the British dragoons, are in blue coats. It should be the reverse. But still, it's nice to have a uh, colorized picture. The key to understanding Lee's treason is that after his capture, he underwent a dramatic change of mindset. Prior to the war, he had been a strong proponent of Republican government, and he was a fierce critic of monarchical rule, including King George III himself. After moving to America in 1773, he became one of the most ardent Whig leaders. 
he wrote a popular pamphlet expressing confidence in the American militia's ability to defeat British soldiers. That was important. He supported a complete break from Britain months before the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. By the third month of his imprisonment, however, Lee had changed his mind about the ability of the Americans to secure their independence. There was the American army's crushing defeat at the Battle of Long Island, where militiamen had run away. Remember how he put so much trust in militiamen. The British army had then easily taken New York City, including uh, enjoying themselves at Francis Tavern. Next, it had chased Washington's army out of New Jersey and across the Delaware River. Lee conf lost confidence in Washington as a leader. And now the man he considered America's last best hope himself was a prisoner uh, in New York City who wouldn't be released anytime soon. Lee now believed that the Americans could not defeat the British. Therefore, he concluded the bloodshed should end as soon as possible. America should renounce its declaration of independence and rejoin the British Empire. Lee decided to write a handwrite a military plan designed for the British to conquer Americans quickly. When he finished, Lee handed the uh, document to Henry Strachey. He was the personal secretary to Admiral Lord Richard Howe, the commander of the British Naval Forces in America. Uh, Lee no doubt hoped that Strachey would hand that document to uh, Lord Howe and William Howe, who was the commander in chief uh, of the army, the British army in North America. Strachey, as Lee knew, was also the uh, secretary to the Royal Commissioners, as the Howe brothers began to call themselves, when acting in their capacity to negotiate an end to the rebellion. Strachey sat down at his desk and he labeled the uh, document, Mr. Lee's Plan. You can see it right there. Um, and uh, that's also uh, his written, uh, plan right there. And it's in the New York Public Library, so it was a lot of fun to be able to pick it up and, and uh, read it in person. Lee did not sign his plan. Uh, he was afraid it might fall into American hands, but it's unquestionably in his handwriting. Importantly, it contains many views that he held throughout his captivity. Lee began this nearly eight-page plan admitting that he had, and I quote, sincerely and zealously abandoned the American cause. I quote, as on the one hand, and you can see that in a handwritten uh, letter or his handwritten memo at the top there, as on the one hand, it appears to me by the continuance of the war, America has no chance of obtaining the end she proposes herself, that is independence, that although by struggling, she may put the mother country to very serious expense, both in blood and money, yet she must in the end, after great desolation, havoc and slaughter, be reduced to submit the terms harder than might be probably granted at present. Lee explained that the Britain too had an interest in ending the war quickly, and I quote, as on the other hand, Great Britain, though ultimately victorious, must suffer very heavily, even in the process of her victories, every life lost and every guinea spent being in fact, in fact worse than thrown away. It is only wasting her own property, shedding her own blood, and destroying her own strength. Lee believed that the Americans could uh, obtain, uh, let's, let's go, go back to, uh, we'll go back to Lee's plan. So Lee believed that the Americans could obtain generous peace terms with the House. And they were, you know, moderate leaders uh, based on, and I quote Lee, the high opinion I have of the humanity and good sense of Lord and General Howe, he was persuaded that the terms of accommodation will be as moderate as their powers will admit. Most of Lee's plans is really military, how, to, how the British should uh, take over Philadelphia. I'm not going to get into all, to all that, don't have time. But Lee sincerely thought that ending the war quickly was in the best interest of America. Even so, it's difficult to arrive at any conclusion other than that Lee committed rank treason under the Articles of War. Even if some historians would rather blithely pass it off as a momentary lapse of judgment or a mere lark. If you look at a lot of history books, they really don't, they just kind of mention it in a paragraph and they move on. It's, uh, but I think it's a lot more serious than that. Lee never had to face the issue in his lifetime 
as his written plan was not discovered until 75 years after his death. So the, the uh, go into the book about how um, his uh, plan was discovered in Strachey's papers. Now treason is a crime. Crimes are set out in laws. And here's the applicable provision of the Articles of War that applied to Lee. Article 19 of Section 13 provided, whosoever shall be convicted of holding correspondence or giving intelligence to the enemy, either directly or indirectly, shall suffer death or such other punishment as a court-martial shall be inflicted. So who shall ever be convicted of holding correspondence with the enemy? That's the key. The author of the most authoritative treatise on court-martials, William Winthrop, writing in 1920, discusses the requirements for convicting a soldier corresponding with the enemy. First, Winthrop wrote, a single letter written by the soldier to the enemy satisfies the need for correspondence. Second, it was not necessary to find that the letter was treacherous, injurious, or calculated to encourage the enemy. All you needed was any correspondence with the enemy. Winthrop added that the crime is complete in writing or preparing of the letter and the committing to a messenger or otherwise putting in the way to be delivered. Winthrop concluded it is not essential that it be received by the person for whom it is intended. And it seems clear that Lee satisfied all of these requirements. As to the last requirement, Lee met it when he handed his plan to Strachey or to a British guard, and he knew the British guard would hand it to Strachey. Neither of the Howe brothers needed to have read the military plan or to have relied on it in order for Lee to have violated the prohibition. Still, by the terms of the correspondence, he meant that the Howes would read it, and he was addressed essentially to the Howes. Here's uh, Lord Howe, William Howe, the commander of the British Army. Now, in reality, to be convicted of treason, it's got to, the correspondence has to be either treacherous or secret. Uh, but in Lee's submission of his military plan constituted both. The Continental Army second in command had revealed what he thought were the weak points of the American resistance for the Howe brothers to exploit. Hard to believe he would do that. Uh, Lee's plan by its own terms was intended to influence Williams Howe's military strategy in his upcoming campaign to seize Philadelphia. His conduct in delivering his plan to Strachey was in a word unconscionable. Under the Articles of War, Lee may also have violated Article 19's separate prohibition against giving intelligence to the enemy. Some of what Lee uh, wrote in his plan, eight-page plan, was very specific information. So that could have been intelligence, but I don't, I don't have the time to get into that. Now, Lee's treason was not as bad as America's most famous traitor. We all know who that is. Benedict Arnold, and this is uh, actually the only known image of Arnold from life. So this is really what he looked like, even though you see a lot of other images of him. Arnold was paid the equivalent in today's money of more than $1.2 million. Arnold openly took up arms against America. He raided Virginia, he raided uh, Groton and Connecticut. After the war, he moved to England. Lee did none of these things. But still, Lee did commit treason, even though he uh, never joined the opposing side and he, you know, was not as bad as Arnold. By keeping his role secret from the Americans, the wily Lee kept his position open. If the British won the war, <clears throat> he might get credit for trying to end it through negotiations. Maybe he could avoid a hanging. Remember, he was a lieutenant colonel in the army and he was worried about being hanged. If instead he was released back to the Americans, he could again be the Continental Army's second in command. So keeping this secret from the Americans was important for him. It's crucial to understand that Lee's beliefs that Americans should negotiate an end to the war, renounce the Declaration of Independence, and go back to the Crown rule continued throughout his 15 months of incarceration. He wrote letters and met with British senior generals to that end. Thus, his military plan wasn't just a, uh, a mere lark or fearing being hanged shortly after his capture or experiencing a temporary weakened state of mind shortly after his capture, three months after, by the way. Lee's continued efforts to encourage peace negotiations was simply one of element of a 15-month secret effort to end the war. Consistent with Lee's dramatic transformation of his mindset in early February 1777, Lee sent a letter to the Continental Congress that asking that a small delegation 
meet with him in British held New York City to discuss matters of quote, public importance. Clearly his goal was to promote negotiation to end hostilities. That's what he meant by public importance. There had been one previous meeting between a continental uh, congressional delegation and Lord Richard Howe on Staten Island in September, 1777. It came to nothing. Here's the uh, nice image of the uh, meeting. There's Lord Howe on the right, Ben Franklin, of course, that's supposed to be John Adams to his left and Edmund, Edmund Rutledge of South Carolina in the background. In a letter written to a month after this meeting occurred, Lee lambasted the Continental Congress for even sending the delegation to sit with Lord Howe, calling it ridiculous that Lord Howe would have a reasonable terms to offer. Now he was requesting another such conference. Nothing really had changed. Congress rejected the idea. Sometime in 1777, while he was still a captive, Lee must have met a British officer in New York. He had a lot of friends in the British Army. He had been a lieutenant colonel in the British Army who conveyed messages to Lee's relative in Britain, Sir Charles Bunbury. So, so, so Charles Bunbury in Britain was actually a member of the House of Commons. And Bunbury actually announced what Lee said in a session of the House of Commons in, in the British Parliament. Other historian, historians have ignored Bunbury's speech, probably because no underlying letter uh, was ever found. But I actually uh, think it wasn't necessarily a letter and, and it's still important. It's unlikely that Bunbury just made this up. And moreover, the message conveyed in Bunbury's speech, which was that Lee was promoting negotiations. This is how you get America to negotiate. You give him the carrot and the stick. That was consistent with uh, Lee's mindset at the time. Here's a printed um, version of Sir Charles Munbury. You can see that he's, he's a, a, of the debates in the House of Parliament. This is it published in 1779. But uh, Lee was lucky that no patriots in the US learned of this development. You can see at the bottom there, from the authority of a dear but unfortunate relation of his, the unhappy General Lee, et cetera, et cetera. Now in early 1778, Lee submitted a long letter to British commanders in New York City offering his services as a moderator to end the war. By this time, after the great American victory at Saratoga, he thought that the Americans could win the war then. Uh, they could do so by avoiding battles. Yet he still desired a negotiated peace and for America to renounce the Declaration of Independence and rejoin the Crown. On March 22, 1778, Lee met with the senior general in New York City, Sir Henry Clinton. Here's an image of Clinton. We'll get to him later as well. I discovered uh, that Clinton wrote a memorandum summarizing their discussions about Lee's willingness to help in an effort to negotiate an end of the war. My book is the first time that this meeting has, uh, this memo has been discussed in print. Uh, now Lee was just released back to the Continental Army in April 1778. So he finally gets exchanged for Richard Prescott. Remember that, that was the first book I did in an early June 1778, months after his release, several months after his release, Lee sent letters to Clinton and to a new British peace, uh, peace commissioner who just arrived in North America in Philadelphia from London. Now, how these letters were delivered, we don't know. It's all very secret correspondence. Lee's secret correspondence with the British commanders both during and after his captivity probably also constituted treason. A senior general should have leeway to negotiate a cessation of hostilities, but not unless he's authorized by his government, a permanent peace between the warring parties. Lee eventually realized he made a mistake by submitting his military plan to the British. He never submitted it again, he never did it again. Many great men make an awful impulsive mistake. Such a mistake does not make up the totality of the man, even if the mistake was a significant one like committing treason. The Philadelphia signer of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin, Benjamin Rush, noting the good and bad qualities in Lee, admitted that he was useful in the beginning of the war by inspiring our citizens with military ideas and lessening in our soldiers their superstitious fear of the valor and discipline of the British Army. Lee did effective work in the field, in the military theaters of Boston, New York, 
Virginia, and South Carolina. And as later explained in my book, Lee performed a crucial service to the Patriot cause at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Still, to gain a complete portrait of the man, it must be understood that when he was a prisoner, Lee committed treason. All right, let's change the topic. Uh, Lee's treason was never discovered by the Patriots, allowing Lee, after his release in April 1778, to rejoin the Continental Army. About two-thirds of the book uh, discusses Lee's generalship at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse and his subsequent court-martial and approval of his sentence by uh, the Continental Congress. After his return, Lee was given command of many of the finest troops with orders from General Washington to attack the rear guard of British General uh, Henry Clinton's column as it lumbered from Philadelphia towards New York City. So Clinton had heard that the French were at a fleet about to arrive in North America. They were afraid that, uh, uh, that uh, they could get trapped in the uh, Delaware River and, and um, they wanted to consolidate their forces now that the French were in the war. So uh, Howe took a number of um, Tories and, and troops by sea to New York City, but most of Clinton's army was marched from Philadelphia to Sandy Hook, New Jersey. And on how Lord Howe's return trip, he picked up, he, the plan was to pick up those soldiers and take them to New York City. So, but Washington uh, wanted to attack um, uh, um, Clinton's forces. Didn't necessarily want to get in a pitched full battle. He was concerned about being defeated. But politically, you know, he had lost the Philadelphia campaign, lost Brandywine, did a good job at Germantown, but made a bad decision there and lost Germantown. Uh, now that um, his troops had gotten excellent training at Valley Forge, due in large part to von Steuben and his training methods, he wanted to prove that the American army was ready to fight <clears throat> and to, yeah, which would help his position. So uh, he, he wanted uh, Lee to attack, and Lee fully intended to attack <clears throat> on June 28, 1778. But he decided to retreat to more defensible ground. Let me take a little sip of water. He retreated in part because two of his generals, Charles Lee, excuse me, Charles Scott, and William Maxwell, without orders and without informing Lee, moved more than half of Lee's force off the battlefield. Lee also retreated because Clinton's bold move, Clinton's still shown there, to reverse his march. So Lee had hoped to attack the rear guard of the British. Clinton was marching away, four miles away, but he found out that Lee's troops showed up. So Lee reversed himself. Uh, first, he had Cornwallis's uh, uh, elite guards and grenadiers marching, more than 2,000 troops, some of the best troops in the world. And then Clinton was following with more than 4,000 of his regular troops, vastly outnumbering Lee. And Lee now, was, he had less, half, he started out with 4,500 men, but when 2,300 men from Maxwell and uh, Scott left, he had uh, under 2,200. So um, Lee ordered a retreat, not easy to do. He might get, you know, he was also worried about getting stuck in a ravine uh, if he stood his ground, could have wiped out his forces. Uh, he ordered a retreat. Sometimes ordering a retreat, that's hard to do, but he uh, did it because it was the right thing to do. At the same time, he organized an effective delaying action. It's what's called the hedgerow that helped to stall the British advance. In doing so, Lee probably saved his force from destruction, thereby performing a crucial service for the Patriot cause. Here's an uh, image of, um, from Monmouth Battlefield in New Jersey. It's a state park, really one of the best preserved uh, battlefields in the Revolutionary War. It's, uh, it's off of um, about 50 minutes off exit nine in the New Jersey Turnpike. And if you have a chance to view it, you, I definitely encourage it. Here's uh, uh, one of the battle maps in the book. The, map, the book has six battle maps, just focused on the Battle of uh, Mama Courthouse. So um, here you can see uh, Maxwell and Scott retreating. Um, and up the north on the right side is uh, Clinton's troops are, are coming down. 
you can see Cornwallis's Grenadiers and Guards starting their march. I think that, and this is the, the site of the hedgerow, which was one of the, the, really the bloodiest part of the battle and, and Americans fought very well, very strongly, but eventually were overwhelmed by the numbers and had to retreat. Lee was at that site, we'll talk about that later. Now, after the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, uh, Lee was charged with failing to attack the enemy and making an unnecessary retreat. At his court-martial trial, his most virulent detractors included the general most responsible for the retreat, Charles Scott, a confused Anthony Wayne, and two of Washington's brilliant but young and relatively inexperienced aides, Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence. Also at his uh, court-martial, the president of the court-martial was Lord Sterling, uh, William Alexander, and uh, one of uh, Washington's top generals. In finding Lee guilty of all charges lodged against him, the court-martial judges failed to implement impartial military justice. They apparently decided the matter on non-military grounds. Lee had imprudently made the matter a political contest between him and his commander, Washington, and only one of them could prevail. Lee did not understand that uh, in this environment, truth mattered little. One man was much more popular and important to the Patriot cause than the other. Lee was convicted on all counts and suspended from the army for one year. Here's a great drawing of um, Charles Lee. You can see uh, by Kosciuszko, the cavalry, Polish cavalry officer. And you can see he's in a boot and his arms are um, trapped. So he's, uh, he's the suspended uh, general. And you can see his large nose there. So that, uh, I'm not sure if Kosciuszko, I couldn't find that Kosciuszko. Cusco met him in person, but um, uh, certainly the large proboscis uh, would suggest that maybe he did. Um, now, after the approval of the sentence by Congress, which itself is an interesting story, as a result of dramatic confrontations and court martial proceedings, Lee faced challenges to duel by with guns, John Lawrence, Anthony Wayne, and Baron von Steuben. Lawrence and Lee actually fought a duel. Alexander Hamilton barely avoided a duel with one of Lee's outraged aides, and Lee tried to provoke a duel himself. Here's John Lawrence, whom Lee dueled. Uh, Lee actually injured, excuse me, Lawrence actually injured Lee slightly in the duel, uh, but then they, that ended it. Here's um, a statue of von Steuben at the, uh, Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Now, Stu, Steuben became, well, uh, Stu, uh, I should go back and Lawrence got upset because he got upset how Lee criticized Washington. And, and uh, so Lawrence was defending Washington's honor, which really wasn't permitted in the Code Duello, but Lee went along with it anyway, uh, in part because Lawrence had been um, very rude to him in the court martial testimony. Now, uh, Steuben became angry that Lee said he had been a distant spectator during the battle. And Lee's remark, as usual, was harsh, but accurate. Lee Steuben really didn't play much of a role. Uh, but here we have it. Steuben has a um, statue at the Battle of Monmouth, and Lee does it. But uh, Steuben does deserve a statue because his troops performed very well, as I argue in the book. The Continental Army performed very well in the battle and uh, really uh, uh, justified Steuben's uh, training. Here's Anthony Wayne. Uh, he was a very military oriented guy, but this was not his best battle. He made unwarranted demands for more troops um, and Lee called him out for it in the court martial. But that upset Wayne and uh, it was lucky that they did not do it. Now, this is the uh, first book to delve closely into the details of the court martial itself, as well as to blame Charles Scott and William Maxwell. In refusing to ask the court martial members to reconsider the verdict on the first two charges, it was also not George Washington's finest hour. He was happy to get rid of a pain in his neck because Lee had, you know, had been criticizing Washington on, when he came back. It was the Revolutionary War's most scandalous court martial, as I call it, and one of the most unfair in America's military history. 
Nonetheless, much of the blame for the court-martial lies with Charles Lee himself. He failed on the day of the battle to keep Washington informed of the uh, changed circumstances at the front. And this led to Washington arriving on the battlefield, seeing the retreating soldiers, which led directly to the famous confrontation between the two battle, uh, generals on the battlefield. Lee in turn could not brook the, strain, the stain on his reputation from that exchange, Washington upbraiding him on the battlefield, and he impulsively and unwisely requested a court-martial to clear his reputation. At the same time, he insulted his commander, making it a contest between the Continental Army's highest ranking generals. At his uh, court-martial, Lee tried to put the blame for the retreat of his force where it properly belonged on Charles Scott. Scott was a rough uh, frontier leader from Virginia. He had a very strong personality. Scott resisted and, and tried to turn the blame on Lee, and Scott succeeded. He got to Washington first after the battle and unfairly blamed Lee for the retreat. Scott's grudge against Lee for exposing his unwarranted retreat continued for many years after the war. As an elderly man in the early 19th century, Scott concoct concocted a fanciful story about how Washington at their first meeting uh, during the battle swore at Lee. So here's the most famous painting of the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, Emanuel Leutz's painting. You can see Washington trying to uh, rally his troops. Uh, Lee is um, uh, in, in disgrace to his, uh, to his left, to his right. Uh, interesting here in this picture, uh, painting uh, Washington as a brown horse and Lee has the white horse. Now here's the uh, painting that graces the cover of my book. This is by John uh, Ward Dunsmore, done in 1908, and it's called The Battle of Monmouth, Washington Rebukes Lee. So in this one, Washington has a white horse, which seems more appropriate, and Lee has the brown horse. Lee is not backing down on this one like the other painting, so I think it perhaps is, is more appropriate. One of the ironies here is that um, the first soldiers that General Washington saw when he came in the battlefield, he saw a Pfeiffer, he saw some other soldiers retreating, he asked, why are you retreating? Oh, we don't know, from a ghost. Those soldiers were in Maxwell's brigade, and Maxwell was one of the two generals who retreated without orders and without informing Lee. Um, so he was responsible and, and, and for Lee's retreat in large part. And those were the first uh, uh, troops that uh, Washington saw. Now they had marched through forests, so it wasn't surprising that they weren't marching in, in order. And, and none of the uh, units that retreated were caught by the British, no flags were lost. It was, it was a good retreat. It's not easy to do a retreat, but it was actually well done. Now a uh, friend, asked if General Lee ever swore, asked Scott. Scott responded, and I quote, yes, once, it was at Monmouth, and on a day that would have made any man swear. Yes, sir, he swore on that day till the leaves shook on the trees. Charming, delightful. Never have I enjoyed such swearing before or since. Sir, on that ever memorable day, he swore like an angel from heaven. Now, Scott was not an eyewitness to the exchange between Lee and Washington. He was about a half mile away with his brigade. His story is completely refuted by the court-martial testimony at Lee's trial that was taken mere weeks after the battle. So, you know, you're reading the testimony about this exchange, nothing like this occurred. Yet many historians continue to repeat this story as if it were or could be true. Now, Scott's uh, fanciful story was in response to his friend trying to cure Scott of his bad habit of swearing, profanity. The friend asked if Washington ever swore, hoping to show that Scott should follow his former commander's pristine example. Thus, Scott's ins story insulted Washington, insulted Lee, and was an attempt to put himself in a better light by bringing Washington down to his level. He also insulted the Christian religion by suggesting that angels in heaven swore. So it was a real nice trifecta performance by uh, the conniving Scott. I don't want to get too much into detail here about the battle or the court martial. It's in the book. The longest battle is on the Battle of Monmouth, and it's one of the most complicated and interesting battles of the war. And the uh, Continental Army, again, uh, fought very well. 
book contains six battle maps created just for the book. Uh, it relies a lot on court martial testimony of the officers who recently have participated in the story. They were testifying at Lee's trial. So we could really read about strategies and tactics in real time. There are three chapters on the court martial and one on Congress's approval of the sentence. Uh, I'm going to end with a story about Alexander Hamilton and Charles Lee. They hated each other. Here's a very, not very commonly seen image of Alexander Hamilton. This was done by Charles Wilson Peale in 1777. So this is, a lot of people see the image of uh, Hamilton when he was in his 40s, but this is when he was in, in his early 20s. He certainly was brilliant, that's for sure, at this age. Some historians claim that Hamilton lied on the stand at the court-martial proceedings. But on the key issues of the court-martial, Hamilton told the truth, and he actually, his testimony supports Lee's defense. What enraged Lee and his allies was Hamilton's testimony that during the battle, Lee had lost his composure. This charge infuriated Lee. He always took great pride in his battlefield composure. Lee was a little bit irrational when he wasn't on the battlefield, but when he was on the battlefield, he was, he was good. He was also a soldier in fortune. He served in military capacities on two continents and for kings. So it was crucial for him and others respected his calm and professional demeanor during a battle. At his court martial, Lee countered Hamilton by telling a story about the battle that made Hamilton look silly. This story made Hamilton's enemy, enemies, particularly in his later years, Howl with laughter. I'm going to read from the book. Lee used his aide, John Mercer, this is at the trial, in his closing statement to tell a story that made Hamilton look like a novice on the battlefield. After Washington had ordered Lee to make a stand with his troops at the Hedgerow, Lee calmly declared to his superior that he would set an example to his men by being one of the last men to leave the field. Hamilton charged up to Lee at a full gallop. Flourishing his sword, he excitedly exclaimed to Lee, I will stay here with you, my dear general, and die with you. Let us all die here rather than retreat. Such youthful ardor for death took Lee aback. Later, he described Hamilton as much flustered and in a sort of frenzy of valor. In his closing statement, Lee explained that his main goal at the hedgerow was to give the enemy a check in order to give time for the troops and his detachment to safely pass through the West Ravine over the bridge spanning the Spotswood Middle Creek, you saw that picture of the water, and to gain time for General Washington to make a disposition of his army in a defensive position on Perrine Ridge, Perrine Ridge, which Washington did and held back the British. The general had no intention of unnecessarily sacrificing the lives of the defenders at the hedgerow or his own. Resolving to teach this presumptuous aide-de-camp how a true general behaved under fire, Lee asked Hamilton to observe him carefully and to mark whether he revealed any signs of agitation. Should be at this point, the British army was like marching right at his, him and his troops. Hamilton replied that Lee seemed tranquil and fully possessed of his faculties. The general then declared that he was as ready to die in the upcoming struggle as was Hamilton himself but that his first responsibility was to his men. When the Continentals under his charge had safely retreated over the bridge, he told Hamilton, I do not care how soon we die. A chastened Hamilton remained silent as Lee turned his attention to improving the defenses at the Hedgerow. Years after the war, General Henry Knox, who was also at the Hedgerow, regaled President John Adams, who was a, at this point an enemy of Hamilton's, with stories of Hamilton's heat and effervescence at Monmouth. Hamilton, however, got the last laugh. Lee was suspended from the army for a year. He never returned to the army. Here is Lee's uh, house in Lee Town, West Virginia, named after Lee. And he tried to become a farmer. He was not a success. He lived in the back part of the house, and it was only one story at that time. And the store and the inside the house was, was there were no walls, so it was not a good situation. Uh, Lee went to Philadelphia to try to sell his farm to get some money, but he uh, died in a tavern in 1782, accompanied by his dogs. Here's a picture of me 
at Christ Church in Philadelphia. Uh, a beautiful church, of course, Philadelphia is a great place to visit. If you look at the doorway on the left there, far left side of the photo, that's where we're gonna go next. This is where Lee is buried. So he was buried uh, in 1782. There was a decent congregation of prominent uh, patriots and some French officers who were at his uh, funeral. But he was buried in what became a road, so they had to move his body. As a matter of fact, within a few weeks after his uh, funeral, no one knew where his body had been buried because he couldn't afford a, uh, a gravesite, a monument. But here is a, a monument to Charles Lee that was put up by Samuel Patterson, who wrote a biography of him in 1958, who was called the Knight Errant of Liberty a very supportive uh, pro-Charles Lee book. Now, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda in his spectacular historical Broadway musical, Hamilton, which I love, presents the following exchanges about Lee. So here's, here's of course, the Hamilton Broadway. Uh, Hamilton, instead of me, he promotes Charles Lee, makes him second in command. Lee, I'm a general, Wee Hamilton, yeah, he's not the choice I would have gone with. He shits the bed at the Battle of Monmouth. Washington, everyone attack. Lee, retreat. Washington, attack. Lee, retreat. Washington, what are you doing, Lee? Get back on your feet. Lee, but there's so many of them. Washington, I'm sorry. Is this not your speed? Hamilton, Hamilton, ready, sir. Washington, have Lafayette take the lead. Hamilton, yes, sir. Lawrence, that's John Lawrence. A thousand soldiers die in 100 degrees heat. Lafayette, as we snatch a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. Hamilton, Charles Lee was left behind without a pot to piss in. Now, most popular histories, and some others as well blame Lee for failing to strike the enemy a powerful blow at Monmouth. This view needs to change. A good starting point would be to reevaluate Lee's court martial conviction. In our country, uh, fair trials are still an important value. So is the judgment of history. Lee should be credited for possibly saving a good portion of the Continental Army at Monmouth. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. That was very interesting. Um, I didn't know much about Charles Lee before this. I feel like I'm learning a lot. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ali, who is going to commence our Q&A. If you have a question and you haven't dropped it in the chat yet, now is the time. All right, such great questions, everybody. I've got some nice things to choose from here. Um, let's start with, uh, Robert wants to know what your thoughts are on how Lee was captured by the British. Well, uh, that was covered in my Kidnapping the Enemy book, which I, was definitely one of my better written books because it's a, it's a great story and it's coupled with the capture of Richard Prescott by uh, William Barton of Rhode Island, who is a hero out of nowhere, then he suffers tragedy and then he has good stuff at the end of his life. But um, Lee was three miles from his troops. Um, he was reckless and um, he should have been closer to his troops and he wasn't. And he, there were, weren't many houses in the area, he decided to go to this tavern and um, William Harcourt and his dragoons were sent out to reconnoiter. They knew Lee was around, they wanted to find out where he was. And in those days, Tories, civilians, they knew everything. Patriot Tories, Tory civilians. And the Tories knew that Lee was in the neighborhood staying at this tavern. And they told Harcourt that. And um, <clears throat> so he was uh, surrounded and um, easily taken. So it was, a, it was a disgraceful. Now Richard Prescott in, the, in Rhode Island was, it was more of a, a very impressive special operation that was done to go across Narragansett Bay in the middle of the night walk a mile, surround the house where he was staying at, all being very quiet, take him and, and spirit him back to the mainland. So that was 
<clears throat> that was more impressive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, what was the relationship like between Lee and Washington after the war? Or was there one? Well, uh, Lee died in 1782, the war ended in 1783. And um, Lee, after he was um, <clears throat> suspended from the army in 1779, just wrote some really insulting letters about Washington. Oh, he wasn't responsible, he was the worst general, and even in, in the victories, the responsibility was his subordinates, and he was very, uh, very Lee could be very cutting when he wanted to be. And so, um, and actually throughout most of his life, Lee insulted his superior. So he held off insulting Lee, uh, Washington publicly for quite a long time until he had been suspended from the, from the army. Oh, that's interesting. Um, this kind of leads me into the next question, which is, is there a record of what exactly Washington said to Lee as he admonished him for retreating? Yes, and um, that's, that's in the book. Um, you know, we can really get a good handle about that meeting because we have uh, several um, testimonies from officers who were present at the meeting. And um, basically, it wasn't what Washington said, it was more his tone. He comes, he's coming with the, the second half of the Continental Army, and he sees all these retreating troops. Again, these are William Maxwell's troops. He retreated without permission. And uh, Washington says, what, what is this? What's going on here? Well, I was, I, um, you know, uh, people were making unauthorized decisions without my authorization. And, um, and then Lee said something bad. He said, and that the, I didn't even think we should be doing this battle anyway, which he shouldn't have said. And then Washington says, well, then you shouldn't have taken command and stormed off, you know, in a very insulting way. So it wasn't what he said as more of the tone that really took Lee back. Lee thought he had done a great job, you know, that he had uh, retreated under pressure and saved his army, and now they were in a position to take a good defensive stand. But Washington didn't understand that. He, he just, because he hadn't been told properly about what was going on, Lee didn't send messengers to, to let Washington know. Although Washington did, have, did receive some messengers, so it's not totally accurate. Okay, Thanks. cool. Um, did Lee ever lead a successful battle or campaign? Good question. Um, he was at the, uh, he did a great uh, job of training new raw soldiers at, at the Boston campaign, but there was no real battle there. Uh, he was put in charge of the defense of Charleston, South Carolina in 1776, early. And uh, uh, Clinton came with an expeditionary force, a large part of the British Navy, didn't look very good. Uh, Moultrie, William Moultrie, uh, made the defense at uh, Sullivan's Island of this Palmetto Fort. And it was only half finished. So if the British got around the fort, they could have easily just raked the defenders. And Lee said, you know, you should abandon this. You're, gonna, you're trapping your men. You're going to leave them exposed. But Moultrie went ahead. But to Lee's credit, he didn't, even though he was the head, he didn't insist on um, controlling every situation. So he actually showed some good diplomacy. He strengthened defenses in a few areas. He actually made a wooden bridge of boats that soldiers could use or to get off Sullivan's Island. It turned out that the British ships got stuck in the sandbar so they couldn't come around and rake the side. So, but Lee was actually given credit for that victory, uh, but really it was more Moultrie and, and South Carol Carolinians. Um, at the, at the, in the battles in New York, Lee also gave some good advice, but no, he, he never really led a lot of troops. And this was why, um, uh, you know, at Monmouth, you know, a lot of the American generals were very new and they needed experience. Lee didn't get that experience because um, he was in prison for 15 months. Whereas the American generals did get more experience at Brandywine, at uh, Germantown. So Lee really needed some more experience, even though he did have some in Europe. Um, but uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Okay, I have a few more questions. Um, had Hamilton and Lee disliked each other before the court martial, or did that start during the court martial? Uh, it's a good good question. Um, 
I think, you know, Lee definitely, when he came back from being a prisoner, he started undermining Washington, whispering in people's ears about how Washington was not a good general. Hamilton, of course, you know, very fond of Washington, strong supporter. So he probably uh, found out about that and, and did not like Lee from, from because of that. Both of them were very intelligent uh, men. So um, they also might have uh, opposed each other for that. Uh, Hamilton helped von Steumann with the Continental training the uh, troops at Valley Forge. And he wanted to, he agreed with Washington's uh, assessment that the Continental Army should become more like the British Army. Lee had a different view. Well, we shouldn't be facing the British uh, uh, regulars and grenadiers uh, on the same field. We ought to be uh, doing, we're going to you know, lose. Instead, we should be trading more militia, retreating when we have to. So they had different views. So Hamilton's views were different from Lee on that score as well. But they, uh, during the court martial, they definitely did not like each other. And George, John Lawrence and Lee as well. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned that Charles Lee was challenged to a few duels and that he provoked one. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, he was challenged to a duel by John Lawrence. He got in one, Anthony Wayne, von Steubman. Uh, but he actually challenged William Drayton to a duel. William Drayton was a member of the Continental Congress from South Carolina. They uh, didn't dislike each other back during the expedition against South Carolina. Lee insulted um, Drayton for an artillery uh, post that uh, Drayton had uh, set up, said he didn't do a very good job. So Drayton didn't like him after that. And Drayton led the charge to confirm Lee's uh, conviction in the Continental Congress. So um, maybe I'll try to read uh, what Lee wrote to um, Drayton. This gives you a sense of Lee's you know, incredible uh, vocabulary and his ability to insult. Uh, Lee wrote Drayton, until very recently, I was taught to consider you only as a fantastic, pompous, dramatis persona, a mere malvolio, never to be spoken of or thought of, for the, but for the sake of laughter. And when the humor for laughter subsided, never to be spoken of or thought of more. But I find I was mistaken. I find that you are as malignant a scoundrel as you are universally allowed to be a ridiculous and disgusting coxcomb. So uh, he knew how to do an insult when he wanted to. He tried to get uh, Drayton to uh, duel, but uh, Drayton refused. You know, he came from the dual happy state of South Carolina. <laughs> that is a fabulous insult. I might try to work it into my everyday uh dialect here. Um, okay, so this is going to be our last question. It's my favorite question to ask. If you could dine with anyone at Francis Tavern, who would you dine with? Uh, well, I guess I have to say uh, Charles Lee. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just with a fascinating character. I'm sure he would insult the hell, heck out of me, but um, you know, define more about how we clicked. We know so much about Alexander Hamilton. John Lawrence is uh, the great young man uh, who uh, died too young. He was just too brash. And, uh, he, he died in uh, 1783, toward the end of the war. Uh, but he uh, tried to get South Carolina to uh, free some slaves and allow them to join a Continental Regiment. So he was a very interesting thinker. But um, I'd have to say uh, Charles Lee. <laughs> Perfectly acceptable answer. We'll take it. Thank you. And thank you for hosting me. All right. Um, thank you, Christian, for your uh, lecture and your answers to those questions. Thank you, Ali, for pulling those questions for us. And thank you to everyone watching for submitting those questions and for joining us here this evening. Um, thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. You are really helping us continue these programs. While we're still not having in-person programs, the museum is open once more for visitors. You can reserve a ticket online if you're in the New York area and would like to come on down and see the building, if not the programming. Um, if you would like to donate, if you've enjoyed our programs, you can do that on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. There you can also join our mailing list if you have not yet. Uh, or follow us on social media to stay up to date on all of our upcoming programs. 
If your ears perked up at the mention of Hamilton tonight, you might enjoy next month's lecture, which is going to discuss Hamilton and the musical and his real life biography, uh, which is looking pretty interesting. As I said before, this lecture has been recorded. Uh, so if you missed any of it, or if you'd like to share it with someone or listen again, you should be seeing that appear in your email inbox in a few days. Um, I believe that is everything. So once again, thank you for spending part of your afternoon, evening, night with us. And hopefully we will see you again virtually, but in person really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.